Hello and welcome to the U of Care podcast. My name is Oliver Grundman, and I am very honored to welcome Dr. Christopher McCurdy, a fellow uh, with the Department of Medicinal Chemistry. And uh, yeah, Dr. McCurdy, uh, please introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah, thank you, Oliver. Um, I'm Chris McCurdy. I'm professor of medicinal chemistry and director of the University of Florida's Translational Drug Development Corps. I'm also a member of the CARE faculty. Yeah, so in, in that capacity as a member of the U of CARE uh, faculty, this is a profile about you. And uh, to get us started a little bit, uh, you have been very prominent in the field uh, particularly of, uh, of opioids, and uh, that related adjacent to that, uh, Kratom has become one of your major areas of interest recently. Uh, but what initially got you actually interested in the field of addiction research? Yeah, so it, it's, it is interesting, and usually uh, many people you run into that are in addiction research have a a personal reason as to why they got involved. And for myself, it was a family member, um, not an immediate family member, but a family member that uh, be, became addicted to alcohol and became very alcoholic um, and succumbed to that. Uh, and I just couldn't understand how something that uh, was prevalent and easy to gain access to in our society could, could uh, lead someone down that pathway and, and really you know, turn them into an addict and now uh, understanding it much more as I've researched it and learning the progression of the disease itself um, and realizing that that could happen. That's how I really got interested in this. And um, from from there, I, I did work in pharmacy school um, in a laboratory where I learned uh, I could work in the laboratory environment, do some chemistry, um, and really became interested in pursuing a little bit more detailed research life and uh, had opportunity to go to the University of Georgia for a summer internship program. And there I worked in a medicinal chemistry lab just doing um, drug development synthesis, uh, drug discovery, and um, left that program, went back to pharmacy school to finish pharmacy school, and got a phone call from the uh, department chair at the University of Georgia Medicinal Chemistry wondering why I didn't apply uh, for graduate school. And I said, oh, I'm not going to graduate school. And they said, no, no, we have a we have a spot for you. We'd love to see you come to graduate school. And I said, well, um, I'll, I'll think about it. What would what, what I need to do? And he said, well, you need to take the graduate record exam or GRE exam. And uh, I said, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll look into that. So uh, literally I hung off the phone up the phone and uh, decided I was going to graduate school and it was um, one of those short uh, moments in life that changes your life forever uh, and I ended up going to work on my PhD in medicinal chemistry at the University of Georgia and worked in an area of natural products um, and nicotinic receptors and looking at uh, a product called Lobella inflata or Native American tobacco um, Indian tobacco that was being uh, sort of studied as a treatment for potentially Alzheimer's disease, but also as a potential for smoking cessation uh, therapy. And there was a compound in that plant called lobeline, which was uh, basically what set up the, the foundation for my PhD degree and making analogs of that and looking into that. And then I ended up uh, finishing my PhD degree and moving to a postdoctoral fellowship uh, through the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the University of Minnesota with Philip Portuguese, who was um, the chair, uh, sorry, not the chair, the editor-in-chief of the journal Medicinal Chemistry for 40 years. And so he's sort of one of the stalwarts in the field of medicinal chemistry, but also has been the one that's developed out of his laboratory, the standard antagonist for opioid receptors that are used um, throughout the research field to study these receptors over the years. And so I started in working in opiate chemistry with, a, with an eye on trying to treat opiate addiction, uh, left his laboratory and started my career at the University of Mississippi, uh, which is a rich 
um, University of Natural Products Chemistry, and uh, they have the NIDA marijuana farm there. And um, there was a real great support system for natural products studies there. And that's where I started to work on Salvia divinorum, uh, which was uh, the source of Salvinorin A, which was a very potent kappa opioid receptor agonist hallucinogen that doesn't have nitrogen. So it was traditionally against all the known structure activity requirements for not only an opioid receptor, but a G-protein coupled receptor, aminergic class of G-protein coupled receptors. And so uh, my first funded work from the National Institute on Drug Abuse was around that. And then along the way, uh, NIDA asked me to come and do a, a presentation on naturally occurring analgesics. And that's where I first encountered uh, Kratom and Mitragyna speciosa and realized that there was a huge gap in the scientific uh, literature around this plant and its potential for uh, treating opiate addiction or even treating pain uh, or even treating uh, mood disorders. And so that's where I started diving into this plant. Uh, now it's been 15, 16 years ago uh, and the, we've had that long of a history on it and that's where we are today. Impressive. So you, you have really been uh, basically taking your research on addiction through uh, basically all of the major categories, nicotinic receptors, opioid receptors, those are kind of some of the major targets that we're looking at in regards to addiction research at the moment, if I understand correctly. That's right. And, and we also, uh, th those were really focused on natural product sources. Uh, I also am trained classically as a synthetic uh, medicinal chemist and, and really looking at drug design and drug architecture, if you will. And so we have a large small molecule program as well that I collaborate with other care members here. We, we have a large uh, contingency of care faculty that are collaborating on the Kratom projects. And then, uh, and then we have a, another group of care faculty that are working on our Sigma receptor ligand projects, which are originally, um, directed at treating cocaine and methamphetamine abuse and addiction uh, through sigma receptor proteins. And we were successful in making some of the most uh, selective compounds for sigma receptors and we patented those and we actually have a compound now in clinical trials that targets uh, sigma receptors and looking at nerve damage and, and maybe potential originators of pain uh, sources on nerves. So that's a whole nother story, but it, it really blossomed from the hope that we could find some treatments for cocaine and methamphetamine abuse. Uh, and that project kind of marched on into a different direction. And we actually have some compounds now that um, target multiple receptor proteins, including the sigma receptor, uh, that are successful in, in mitigating uh, cocaine and methamphetamine self-administration in rodents. And so we're we're in the process of pursuing grants along those lines at the moment. So it's, yeah, I would say we've, we've touched on a, a lot of addictive substances, except for ethanol is probably one of the, one of the main ones that we haven't uh, steered near. Although we've worked with uh, Dr. Paris a little bit with her um, uh, ethanol studies and looking at Kratom in, in those uh, cases, we just haven't really gone very deep into that yet. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, without going too much into it, uh, obviously you have, you have broadened your scope uh, again when you talk about the Sigma receptor, which I think was once classified as an opioid receptor, then became right. an orphan receptor. And now, uh, obviously there are now clinical applications for the Sigma receptor. Um, is it still categorized as an, as an orphan receptor or is it opioid adjacent? Where does it stand at the moment? No, it's a very unique protein. Uh, in fact, it's a unique protein among mammalian uh, species. And if you try to look at this protein, which has been cloned, there are two subtypes of Sigma receptor, Sigma 1 and Sigma 2. Both have been uh, cloned and identified in several species. Um, but it, it doesn't have any homology to any other mammalian proteins. And so it's a very unique class of small proteins. It's only 200, sigma-1 receptors, only 223 amino acids uh, in the human. And it's a chaperone protein and is thought to 
um, reside at the mitochondrial associated membrane in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it can be activated upon agonist um, activation, and it's a very uh, promiscuous receptor and it accepts many types of compounds. Uh, and then it and then it translocates to the cell surface, and at the cell surface it does protein-protein interactions, and and it's been uh, shown to modulate um, not only GPCRs but ion channels as well as drug transporters. And so there's lots of interactions that are going on, and then trying to understand and study that uh, has been a, a really interesting challenge along the way. But we also have funding from the Department of Defense to look at these as non-opioid analgesic um, medications. And what's fascinating about them is they don't seem to have much activity in acute pain. Um, in other words, if you're looking at them like we generally test opiates in animals or opioid-like molecules in animals, uh, those are a very effective way to test them, but we don't see those being efficacious in the sigma receptor ligands. Uh, but when we look at chronic pain or animals that have been injured where we're looking at imaging of these animals exactly to find the nerve damage, uh, we can see the protein expression increases quite a bit uh, at these spots of injury. And then we can also reverse uh, really the allodynia that's been created in those situations in animals. And there is a compound in clinical trials in Europe now that's targeting sigma-1 receptors uh, as well. And that's in for neuropathic pain. And, and as I said, our compounds in phase one clinical trials here in the United States, uh, but as a diagnostic imaging agent to look for um, pain generators. Interesting. So uh, that's kind of already the translational aspect, obviously, uh, of what you're doing, um, starting with potentially natural product templates as pharmacophores, as lead compounds to translate that then into potentially uh, compounds that are feasible for clinical trials to take that to clinical trial stages. Uh, what do you regard as some of the greatest challenges that you are currently facing when it comes to that translational aspect or even uh, finding compounds from nature that are feasible to translate or mm -hmm. develop further into feasible candidates for, for clinical trials? Yeah, so, so I think one of the largest problems that we faced so far, and at least in trying to do Kratom clinical trials, is the fact that uh, the FDA has banned importation of Kratom into the United States. Uh, and so then when you go to try and ask permission to do a controlled clinical trial with a Kratom product, um, you know, there's no real way to understand what the chain of custody of that product has been. There's no way to really buy more of that same product if you wanted to go back and try to replicate the study. Um, and each time you buy a natural product, even if it's, you know, your, your tea at the local grocery store, it's going to be slightly different in its composition of, of chemical components. And so um, really trying to understand that, really trying to figure out how can we do some studies. We know that millions of people are using this um, material, but we don't have any, or we have very little human data to understand uh, what, if any, efficacy there is, what, if any, safety there is. Of course, we have millions of anecdotal case reports of people that, that are using on a regular basis that seem to use it safely, but we also have reports of deaths associated with uh, kratom use. And, and most of the time, those have been in combination with other drug products, and we don't even know how to study those drug interactions uh, other than in animal models and try to see if we can replicate some of that in animal models. But that's been the biggest challenge in translation of this research pro program into clinical trials. Um, there is interest in, in purifying alkaloids uh, from that and trying to see if those can be used uh, clinically, but again, when you when you remove something from its natural environment, you're not going to see the same kind of uh, clinical, um, most likely not the same kind of clinical efficacy that you would you would see when it's in combination with all of its natural constituents. And we can say this for opium uh, poppy extract that it has a much different profile than just pure morphine or pure codeine. 
Um, but those are examples of molecules that have been purified out of natural products and obviously used uh, for, for a very long time. Um, and so th there's potential to do this from that standpoint as well, uh, to look at molecules and go that route. But we've been really interested in trying to understand the plant in, in its entirety and understand what benefits are there because this is what people are using out in the public and out in the street and traditionally what they've been using and they've had some success and maybe it is an entourage effect as you would say for something like cannabis um, but we just don't know so that's the biggest challenge we've really seen other than that the big challenge is on the on the synthetic side of the world for our sigma work has been funding <laughs> mm. Yeah, although there seems to be an interest in developing such compounds and getting them into the clinical pipeline, if I understand correctly, to find alternatives to opioids that are not, uh, don't have a, a dependent or don't have the same dependency uh, liability as classical opioids have. Right, that's right. And we, and, and, and as I mentioned, we have uh, funding support from Department of Defense really looking at that exact issue with uh, the military and trying to find better medications for our uh, soldiers that are out in, in uh, theater environments and out in the, the field, something that can be uh, non-impairing to their performance um, and, and, you know, of course, non-addictive so that they don't come home from their tour of duty and end up uh, becoming a drug addict so uh, there's a there's a lot of a lot of hope and a lot of potential there there's just a lot of difficulty in getting from the essentially development phase into the clinical trials and then once you complete a safety trial uh, phase one then th then moving into efficacy trials that those are incredibly much more expensive and um, finding the right partner is is a challenge <laughs> yeah yeah now i understand uh, we are we are short on time a little bit but um i, I think this was a a, a wonderful uh, overview of your research and i hope that you of care uh, can provide you an environment where you can collaborate with others uh, i think you 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 found quite a few collaborators inside and outside of the college of pharmacy within you of care that you can work with together um, and I, I really am excited uh, to, to be a part of the, your department, uh, but also part of U of Care, um, and, and look forward to many more great news coming out of your research group. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to be working with you on some of this too, and also uh, to be working with a huge contingency of folks in U of Care. It's been a, a great experience, a great environment, and um, yeah, more to come. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much, Dr. McCurdy, for taking the time today. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for listening to this uh, uh, podcast of U of Care and look out for the next podcast that will be posted to the U of Care website. Thank you, everybody.